It is Friday, February 8th. Let's talk PlayStation. Okay, so first off, we actually have to cover some news that we missed last week because right after Let's Talk PlayStation last week, that Friday, a bunch of interesting news stories came out. So we'll cover that real quick if you didn't see, but Sony recently announced that they had shipped 94.2 million PlayStation 4s as of December 31st, 2018. Now, if we go real quick back to the predictions video, Sony had announced at the time that they had actually sold 91.6 million PlayStation 4s, I believe, as of December 31st. So technically, they've actually also shipped uh, an additional 3 million some odd units to retailers. That doesn't mean those units have been sold Old, but they're not going to sit around in retailers forever so at some point in the following month Sony's obviously going to sell uh, 94 million PS4 as well beyond that possibly uh, which segues us nicely into uh, this chart that Daniel Ahmad posted on Twitter earlier this week and it kind of shows the rate of sale of PlayStation 4 and just how impressive it is and if we do look at it it is on par with the PlayStation 2 in terms of the same rate of sale. And it's actually also selling a bit faster than the Wii as well. So still very impressive numbers from Sony. Sony also announced that they are at 36.3 million PlayStation Plus subscribers, which is actually up year over year. Uh, and that's actually a peak. So that's the highest that PlayStation Plus subscribers has ever been, which is pretty crazy. That's about a one in three for every PlayStation 4 owner. That's pretty good. Um, and so that tells you what? Sony's making a lot of money. This goes into our next news story, which is that uh, it was also sort of noted earlier in the week that PlayStation Network revenue is uh, more than all of Nintendo's revenue for the previous year combined, which is an interesting metric, sure. I, I don't think it's entirely fair. Or, I mean... I mean, yeah, it's cool to sort of hear that, wow, PSN made that much money that was more than all of Nintendo, and I believe it was also more than Xbox, if I'm not mistaken, but um, the thing you have to understand is that PlayStation Store is, it's large, I mean, there's tons of content on there, not only is it PS4 games, PS2 classics, PlayStation Now, obviously, all that DLC, uh, PlayStation VR games, uh, there's video content on there. I mean, the eShop and, and Nintendo's only selling, selling Switches, they just now got their yearly subscription service out uh, this this past year so i mean it seems somewhat clear to me that psn could easily eclipse nintendo's uh revenue but it just sort of shows you how significant playstation network is and how uh, much growth sony is seeing with uh, with playstation 4 and uh, the, the train is still not stopping as we often say when we see just how impressive Sony's numbers are when it comes to their uh, financials. Now we got some Death Stranding news, and it's the same kind of Death Stranding news that we always have normally, which is that somebody's either played the game or talked about the game, and they've told us a little bit about it, but not quite enough for us to really know what's going on still, so we kind of have to draw our own conclusions. But anyway, the first one is Norman Reedus. He was uh, recently doing an interview with uh, Metro.co.uk, and he had some interesting things to say. He said, and I quote, that guy is such a genius, Hideo Kojima. I'm like, oh, so they'll be playing me and he's like no they are you we will make them cry as you i'm like what are you talking about it's a video game he said the concept is so far out into the future instead of eliminating everyone around you it's bringing everyone together it's a very positive video game but scary and depressing at the same time he continued to say on the trailers show you an aspect of it but not the whole picture of what the game will be that's like a whole other thing it's complicated it's a crazy complicated game i've been learning a lot about video games doing it so not entirely surprising, it's pretty much the same thing he's been saying about the game for a while now, although there was that more detailed synopsis he gave us about a few months back when he was on, I believe, a podcast of some sort, and he told us that the game was about a phobia, the phobia of being touched, and as you progress throughout the game, you get to more okay with it, and people getting closer to you, and things like that, and I, I thought, I still think that's a pretty profound idea, and that still excites me, and I, I want to see that you know, further explored, and I want more people to sort of talk about it a little bit, but the ambiguity of the game, I think, is still pretty exciting. Uh, the other thing is director Jordan Vogd Roberts, who uh, I believe he directed Kong Skull Island, and he's uh, apparently been trying to uh, direct a Metal Gear movie. I believe he's got a script done, and he's been sending it in or whatever, um, but he was allowed to play Death Stranding this past week, and he tweeted uh, that he's very impressed. It seems like he's very impressed, obviously. He said, uh, Hideo Kojima, let me play Death Stranding. The world is next level immaculate. It's like freebasing pure Kojima and Shinkawa. Remember when Fury Road blew you away, but also made you, in the most thankful way, ask, what the fuck, how does this miracle exist? You are not ready. So yes, yet another person enjoyed the game, but what this tells me more than anything is that uh, Kojima's allowing more and more people to play the game that are outside of the studio. Uh, so it's almost like the sort of very early stages of uh, perhaps feedback. Um, you could maybe see more focus testing probably with people that obviously you wouldn't hear from because they're under NDA. But it uh, looks like the game is getting closer to a point where he's letting people outside the studio play it. I mean, certainly there's got to be a certain degree of uh, 
completeness to the game that I think uh, is getting it closer to possibly getting a, a release date of some kind. I, I would hope that's kind of what we're, we're getting to if he's letting this many people try it. Now, as a PlayStation 4 owner, you might not know about EA Access, which is a service that EA offers exclusively on Xbox One, and I believe there's also EA Origins Access on PC. I'm not entirely sure what the difference is there, but it's a service that EA offers $5 a month, $30 for the whole year. It's just like Xbox Game Pass. You get a selection of EA games that you can download locally to your Xbox One. Uh, most of them are old games, but some of them, I believe, are new. Uh, some of them are like within a year to two years of, of release, or you might get access to a, an early demo or a beta, things like that. You're, you know, you're getting that sort of benefit of, uh, of joining EA Access. And, you know, a lot of people enjoy the service. If you're a fan of EA games, I mean, seems like a no-brainer for a lot of people. Uh, and a long time ago, when EA actually initially brought this service to Xbox One, and it was exclusively for, for Xbox One, Sony said that they didn't want the service, they felt it wasn't a good value. I believe they only said that because that was a conflict of interest to PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now. But uh, recently, EA said that they are looking to bring the service to another major platform. Now, what could that possibly be? Well, that only leaves us with two other options, really, which is Nintendo Switch or PlayStation 4. The Switch does not really have that many EA games. Don't really know how you'd offer the service there, especially since Nintendo doesn't, doesn't really understand how online works. Uh, it seems like that's probably going to be PlayStation 4. So, uh, not a bad deal, honestly. If you're the kind of person that does buy uh, one or two EA games at least every single year, I mean, it probably isn't the worst deal in the world considering it's $30. Uh, but again, you're also getting access to all those older games as well, and you're you're storing them locally to the hard drive. You know, you're not streaming them or anything, which I, is always a big thing for some people. And uh, it looks like maybe Sony's finally uh, coming around to letting the service on is that they're coming around to uh, many ideas in the games industry that they have uh, previously blocked before. Which is a good segue into our next news story about EA trying to do uh, more cross-play and uh, we kind of know what the problem there is when, when it comes to PlayStation 4. So actually uh, the CEO of EA, Andrew Wilson, uh, had this to share in regards to uh, the recently released Apex Legends and also the FIFA games. He said, We think cross-play and cross-progress is going to be a very important part of our future, and you should anticipate that we'll be doing more in that space. What our information would suggest to us is that there isn't a tremendous amount of play across devices, but that overall liquidity in any gaming community is a good and positive thing, even if it's only for a few small people or a small portion of the community that utilizes that. We absolutely are looking into that in the context of Apex, and we'll be looking at that across our portfolio over time. We think about franchise with tremendously large communities like FIFA, and we think that they would absolutely benefit from cross-play and cross-progress, as more and more people come into these big communities. Now, obviously, this is okay on the Xbox and PC front, because while well, Microsoft's kind of at the forefront of this with Xbox One, and uh, Sony's the one that's uh, not being uh, overly optimistic about it, and they're doing the open beta and the game-by-game -game basis, which I still think is so ridiculous, but uh, looks like that's something that EA is certainly exploring, and now that they're being more vocal about it, tells me that the conversations that they're having with Sony uh, are certainly uh, going in the right direction. Now this one I found a bit strange, but PlayStation Spain recently sent the press out some invites for Deacon's Wedding from Days Gone, and the date is February 13th, so keep that in mind. February 13th, something is going to happen with Days Gone. The only thing I will say about this is that uh, whenever you usually see a smaller territory of the PlayStation division tease something or sort of do their own thing, their own event or whatever, it's normally not a very big announcement. Uh, it's not a knock or anything, I'm not insulting those territories whatsoever, but it's just more, so you see more significant announcements out of um, Sony Interactive Entertainment America or Europe or Japan. That's just kind of the way it is. So I'm, I'm, not, inspecting, I'm not expecting anything crazy out of this, but... Uh, uh, keep it in mind. Now, going into the Dreams beta, it was actually supposed to end February 4th, but it was extended to February 5th. Now it's obviously over, but Media Molecule said that they have a Dreams update to share with us on February 20th. Uh, they didn't seem to make a big splash about this, so maybe it might not be anything totally significant, but I'm hoping it's a release date. I'm actually praying it's a release date because they're kind of, they've kind of got a good mojo going on right now, which is that they're getting a lot of press because of that beta. We're seeing a lot of those creations and how fascinating they are and just the depth and scope of the game. So I think there's more eyes on it now than there was before. So I don't, I don't want them to lose that momentum. And I think now would be a good time for them to tell us a release date. Uh, so hopefully that's what we're going to get uh, once that date comes, and uh, that's pretty much it. We're just going to have to wait and see on that. Now moving on, we have to talk about this because the implications for this, I think, are... It's, this could go many different directions, but uh, this past week, Microsoft announced that they are bringing Xbox Live to iOS, Android, and Nintendo Switch 
which is a very big one. That is the big talking point amongst many people in the industry and gamers in general. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, now, the thing is, we don't have the actual detail. So uh, Microsoft actually said that they will uh, talk further about this at GDC, and that'll be in March. So, you know, whatever comes about that, I'm sure we'll talk about that come next month. But for now, we don't really know a whole lot. Uh, it's presumed that you will have access to your Xbox Live Friends list you know, achievements, Mixer, you know, some small applications, integrations, things like that. Obviously, this is to also help the cross-play initiative that Microsoft, again, is at the forefront of. Um, and so, I mean, it's clear that Sony's not going to be a part of this, and they're definitely, like, that's the thing. Sony could probably get on board with the cross-play thing. You know, they're probably going to be, I think it's, it's a very kick and scream sort of thing of dragging them through this, but I think eventually Sony will be in a place where they're pretty much approving every single game for... Um, for cross-network play, but I think this is the one thing you're not going to get. You're certainly not going to get an Xbox Live app on the PlayStation Dynamic menu on PS4. You're not going to get that, and that is what Microsoft has been doing in recent years. I mean, it's funny because for, I don't know, like three, four years ago when Microsoft was getting really serious about Xbox everywhere and unifying Windows and Xbox, many people thought it was polarizing because, the you know, it's why buy an Xbox One console at that point when you can just get all their games on PC? And what's, you know, that's fine. That's what many people are doing. Um, but so uh, you can see that Microsoft is really taking Xbox uh, as a, as more as a brand and service than it is, as, as, as a console. I mean, Phil Spencer has been pretty vocal about how consoles are still important. They still want to sell hardware. They're not going to ever have a problem with wanting to sell people hardware. If they can sell millions and millions of Xbox Ones and the next generation Xbox, they're certainly going to try to do that. But I think much like they are with Sony, Sony's thinking long-term, Microsoft's thinking long-term game as well. They understand that many um, games and uh, and things like that, are, they're turning into a service. We're turning into a, uh, a situation where you can have access to your games anywhere. And the fact of the matter is, uh, a, a game sale is a game sale. It doesn't matter where it's being played. I mean, hardware sales are fine, but as you see over the last two decades, more and more consumers and in every single industry is moving away from physical hardware that you buy and more towards services, whether that's movie, uh, movies, music, TV, everything is moving away from that traditional hardware. And uh, Microsoft understands that. And um, so while Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo are still vouching for hardware and that they'll continue to release hardware, that doesn't mean they're going to not try and, uh, you know, sort of capitalize on where many consumers are sort of moving towards. And that's why Microsoft wants to put Xbox everywhere. And it doesn't even matter if it's a Nintendo Switch. If anything, this greatly upsets me that uh, Nintendo is almost submitting to the fact that they... <laughs> are not going to genuinely try to make a proper friends list, a proper uh, achievement trophy system, a proper application system where there's tons of these third-party apps that you can, you know, use on your Switch and uh, they're integrated, you know, through cross-game functionality and uh, using the games uh, in between apps and things like that. It's just, it's like Nintendo submitted to the fact that, look, we're making, that we make games, we make ga a game machine, that's it. We don't want to get into the online thing, but we'll let Microsoft do that. And the th the funny thing I also see is always people saying that uh, uh, Nintendo, because Nintendo's doing so well with the Switch, this is uh, their real competition to Sony and Microsoft. I've never understood that sentiment throughout every generation that Nintendo's been in. I mean, well, not until, you know, I'd say 25 years ago when Nintendo was like, one of the only few players in the games industry and it was more of a choice between say nintendo or sega or atari um but more so today in recent in the recent 15 or so years nintendo is always seen as a and you know keep in mind this sounds anecdotal but we all know it's true it's a, a device that you have along with something else we don't there's not many people that just have switches many people buy a switch alongside another console or another platform preference in general like pc for example or many pc players often buy just one other console one playstation 4 one xbox one one nintendo switch um, but gamers typically have more than one machine and if they have a nintendo console they've also got something else they're not just buying <laughs> nintendo's machines um so why am I saying that? Because Nintendo themselves know that is their position in this industry. They know that they're being bought with other platforms. They're not stupid. In fact, all of these manufacturers are not stupid. They all send out surveys. They all have data suggesting and asking people, how many consoles do you typically own? There's a reason why they ask that. They have this data. They know that their platforms are bought in connection with other platforms. Um, and Nintendo knows their place. They know that... Uh, uh, and I hate saying companion device because it's a fantastic games machine. I love it. I've been playing it honestly more often than my PlayStation 4 in the past six, seven months now. But 
you know, they know that um, they're not the only games machine in a household. They know that other people own other hardware. And that's why I think that they're kind of okay with sort of going forward with, forward with this. Um, and, you know, it might not even be as substantial as we think. I mean, we'll, we'll have to wait till GDC to talk about this further, but it might not be that big of a deal. But the thing we can say with certainty is that Sony's certainly not going to play ball with having Xbox Live on PlayStation 4. And now it's just a matter of if Microsoft sort of succeeds with this approach of having Xbox Live possibly on 2 billion devices, and that's kind of the, the, the buzzwords that they're using there is 2 billion devices because it's mostly handsets, you know, iOS and Android. But um, if they are successful in, you know, getting many people on all those uh, into that ecosystem of Xbox games and buying an Xbox game, and boom, all of a sudden you can play it anywhere, uh, depending on, you know, if it's through the Project X Cloud or if it's natively released on that particular device. Um, but it's uh, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get software sales and keep them into that ecosystem, no matter what device it necessarily is. Where does that put PlayStation? Because as of right now, Sony's focusing on PlayStation Now. Are they going to put PlayStation Now on mobile? Are they going to put it? Are they going to, you know, release day and date Sony first party games on PlayStation Now, which is also available on PC? Are they going to do these things? You know, probably not um, because they seem pretty stubborn in staying where they are in terms of uh, the brand and saying, you know what, you got to buy PlayStation hardware. You got to, if you want to use PlayStation Now, it's best on PS4. You know, I mean, they're very focused on streaming. They're very focused on virtual reality, but they're not very focused on working with others or making their games available everywhere else. And uh, that's fine. That's kind of always been sort of the PlayStation way, if you will. Um, it's just a matter of, is that going to hold? Because um, as much as you guys want to vouch for how well PlayStation 4 is doing, I'm just, I'm telling you, things can change. They, they honestly can. And I agree. Sony has this market dominance. They have this vast party of first party studios that uh, you can only play on PlayStation. And certainly the, Sony's not going to let those games go anywhere else in the foreseeable future. But is it going to hold? Is it going to stay like that? I certainly hope so, because I enjoy those games and I enjoy PlayStation as a platform. It's why I have this YouTube channel. Um, but will Microsoft be success successful in overcoming this sort of um, rock and a hard place that they've been stuck in for a while? Which is that, uh, you know, they've got good things going on. They've been doing very pro-consumer things in recent years, but uh, they're certainly going for the all-out approach of, uh, you know, just getting people to, to buy games. And uh, will it work? It, it might, you know, it, it honestly might. With all that said, I think it's time to get into Let's Talk Plus, our weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you could win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate Red. That's your name. I hope you know who you are. <laughs> I'll be contacting you very soon on Twitter to send you your $10 PSN code. If you would like to win the $10 code, it is very simple. Follow the link down below to the Gleam website. You can subscribe on YouTube. You can follow on Twitter. You can follow on Twitch for an entry. Let me pay for your games. We do this every single week on Let's Talk PlayStation. With that out of the way, those are all the news stories I want to talk about with you guys from this past week. Now, if you didn't see, we did some PlayStation 3 in 2019. I played a bunch of games online, and I tried to see who I could find, who I could talk to. A lot of you saw that video. A lot of you liked that video. Thank you very much. I'm glad you guys enjoyed that. Uh, maybe we'll do something like that in the future. I've got a few ideas buzzing around. Um, I might do that uh, further down the road. But next Tuesday's video, we're going to be looking at some PlayStation facts, specifically the PlayStation 1. I got a lot of facts, a lot of things you might not know about the PlayStation 1. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Stay tuned this coming Tuesday. But other than that, that's all I've got for you. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you guys next Friday.